Well, hello, yes, this is good. Theron Schutte, superintendent of the Marshalltown School District. And uh, right, right now it appears that we have at least one uh, resident that lives along the tennis courts. And we're gonna go ahead and record this presentation as well. I know I had one other resident from Ingledew that called and spoke with me this morning indicating that they weren't gonna be able to participate, but I was able to answer questions. What we wanted to do was describe for the neighbors, if interested, the, the project and particularly talk about uh, the lighting of the project since that'll be a little bit of a new twist uh, from what we've had in the past. The history of this project is that um, in the fall of 2018, we had engaged FEH architects who were engaged with us on the Roundhouse Phase Two project to do an overall athletic facilities assessment and planning process for what we needed to think about in the future for particularly the football soccer complex, the tennis complex at Marshtown High School, uh, look at the softball baseball complex, although we felt those were in pretty decent shape, and then also look at Franklin Field. And as we looked at the tennis court complex, we knew that there were some issues, but we wanted to dig deeper and to see what could be done in the short term or what we needed to be thinking about in the long term. The original courts, which were recently uh, raised, were built in 1974, so it had the original foundation and then at least two, if not three, overlays over the course of the 45 years of their existence. Uh, we had asked um, I believe it was Clap Saddle Garber or engineers that other engineers that uh, FEH had engaged to evaluate the courts to find out what, if anything, could be done short or long term. And to make a long story short, typical tennis courts in the Midwest usually have a total lifespan of about 30 years with the idea that maybe every eight to 10, you need to do some sort of resurfacing overlay. We uh, were able to successfully get 45 years out of those courts. And, and these courts were a partnership from the very beginning with the city of Marshalltown. Uh, it was a 50-50 split in terms of the paying for those courts to be originally constructed and then for the ongoing maintenance as well. So what we found with the engineering study is that um, any significant funding that we put into the courts going forward was probably throwing good money at bad. Um, we could continue to try to fill cracks and to try to patch cracks, but these uh, cracks were, I don't know, structural, radial, and all the above. They were down to the, from the foundation, and um, it was going to be a challenge to make them safe in the short term. Uh, we had two courts already that we had determined to be uh, beyond being able to be used for high, highly competitive matches because the cracks uh, and the, the change in the contour had already reached a point where if a ball hit it, it was going to significantly impact the, the ball's flight or path. So, and, and for safety reasons as well. And so, Make a long story short, I, be, I had been having discussions for a couple years with the city about um, my belief even prior to that work that we were gonna need to be thinking about doing something differently or putting significant funds into redoing the courts. And so um, in terms of our master plan, we developed a plan that would include, that would expand the existing eight courts to an eight court complex uh, the idea there was that we lost four tennis courts from our community when the decision was made by the city to convert the 13th Street tennis courts, which were in at least as bad a shape, if not worse shape, than 
our high school courts to futsal, and they could do that with an overlay of sport court. Um, and so we wanted to have a complex of 12 tennis courts. And then we also knew of the popularity both in Marshalltown through the indoor use of the Coliseum and then the Y for pickleball. Um, and that, and I knew from my time out in the Quad Cities that, you know, this was a recreational activity for the future uh, for people of all ages, but particularly our seniors. Um, and, you know, I, I've seen it grow in other parts of the state and country to where you have grandparents, parents, and grandchildren all playing the game because it's very conducive for all ages. So we were looking at uh, wanting to rebuild with 12 tennis courts, which would then allow us to be very viable to host youth and adult USTA tennis tournaments, uh, state and regionally. Uh, we would also be able to host uh, any um, high school uh, state sanctioned event up through substate uh, tennis. Uh, the only thing we wouldn't be able to host would be an actual state tournament because you have to have indoor courts in the case of inclement weather or have accessible to you at least six or more indoor courts in order to accommodate and then uh, the three pickleball courts. And so um, our goal is really to be a destination for similar to what we um, find for state swimming in AAU events. Um, we want tennis to be a desirable, um, for Marshtown to be a desirable site for USTA youth and adult tennis as well. And by having a 12 court complex all at one site with restrooms and um, uh, available, uh, we will be that. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Epperly from FEH. I think I've been muted. Okay. Can hear you now. Yep, shitty. Uh, my name is Kevin Epperly with FEH Design. Um, also part of our team that's going to be presenting here and, and discussing the project are Lucas Wardenberg with KCL Engineers primarily talking about lighting uh, along with uh, the lighting rep from Musco and Mindy Brindelson talking about the civil engineering with the uh, Clap Silo Garber. And then we might have the ability to have our, our contractor who is managing the construction of the project uh, from Garland Construction, talk a little bit about timeline and some of those aspects. So I will briefly show you the tennis and pickleball court layout, the restrooms that are planned, talk about the trees, um, and of course the parking lot, and then the lighting will be covered by the, the rest of the team. So this is an aerial that shows the existing layout of the current eight courts. Um, can't really see the cracks from here, but it gives, it gives you a sense of uh, where this is located. Uh, and at the same scale, this, this is the intent is to basically provide six courts, two sets of three that are at the same location as the current eight courts, and then six new courts south of that. So the north edge of these courts really don't go any further north than they currently exist. You can see a couple of gray boxes on this plan. Uh, the one to the north that's closest to the property line uh, at the top of the page, that's the storage room. And then to the left of the, the, left of the image uh, is a gateway entrance with a couple of restroom facilities. Uh, this is more of a technical drawing that Mindy is going to show you a little more in detail in a little bit. Uh, these are those tennis courts. This is a new parking lot that's being developed as part of the project. And then pickleball courts as well, and a new uh, walkway going down to the existing sidewalk and parking lot to the east at the school. This line across the bottom, that's the existing high school building. Um, this line up here across the top that is the property line uh, of each of the property owners uh, to the north. 
This is an image. So Kevin, of we should probably mention entry structure. Sorry, right here. Well, I was just going to mention on that last slide for the. I think we have two residents now that are on that um, the lighting will be on the southernmost courts closest to the high school. So they will be further away from where the original courts were. So um, the people that live on Ingledew can see that it's going to be a ways away from them, uh, probably closest to those that live on 2nd Avenue South um, in terms of that first set of three courts anyway. And then of course the pickleball courts, which will have lights will be closest to um, Third Avenue South yeah. residents as well as uh, a couple of the backyards on Ingledew. And this is a view of the entry structure. Um, those are restrooms, men's and women's restrooms on either side and the gateway basically from the new parking lot into the complex. This is a side view of that same structure, so it'll have a slope proof on it. Um, this is a view on the north side of the courts as it currently exists, or did exist a few weeks ago, at least, the fence and that space along here. The intent is that there will be some trees, some trees that are planted uh, along the line of the property line um, to provide some more, more screening than what is there, as well as the windscreen, as the other trees will be removed um, or have been removed during construction. I'll turn it over to KCL and uh, I'll stop sharing my screen so that they can share. Can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. My name is Lucas Wardenberg. I'm with KCL Engineering out of West Des Moines, Iowa. I am working closely on this project with Jason Sealing. Uh, he, Shailene, he is from Moscow. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that name, but it is an Iowa-based company, a sports lighting company specifically. They've done a lot of sports lighting across the United States and internationally. Um, for the Olympic Games and a lot of big stuff. So when it comes to sports lighting, they are the best and they know what they're doing when it comes to this type of installation. Um, we've done a lot of different things from football fields to baseball fields, tennis courts, racket complexes of this nature, um, all over the, across the board. So one of the first things I wanna to talk to you tonight is that there's two parts of this project when it comes to lighting. There's this parking lot that's new, that's gonna be on the west side of the property. And then there's also going to be the tennis courts and the pickleball courts, and those will be lit up with sports lighting. Uh, it's important to differentiate the two because when we're talking about illuminants and how bright your eye level will perceive it to be, there is a drastic difference between the two. Um, I'm going to hand it over for Jason just for a second because he has a great analogy on how a foot candle or illuminance is measured and what that, what, what, how to perceive that. Thanks, Lucas. Uh, so essentially, the easiest way, you think of a gallon of milk, everybody knows a gallon of milk is a gallon of milk, everybody knows a half gallon is a half gallon, or a pint's a pint. Uh, the easiest way to understand lighting is to think of a street light. When you're walking down your sidewalk at night, uh, the street lights are gonna put off an average of two to four foot candles on the street or sidewalk where you're walking. So if you, as we walk through this today, think about a street light putting off two to four foot candles on, on average, you'll be able to relate to what the spill light is going to be on property lines and things of that nature. And also the parking lot and the, will help understand those values a little bit better. Absolutely. Thank you, Jason. So with that uh, analogy and that visualiz visualization kind of in mind, uh, I'm going to show you the parking lot mo uh, model that I did, calculations. And as you see, I have 
these little red squares, those are the lights, and right underneath them, I'm seeing two foot candles. So you're gonna be imagining what it looks like going down, walking down a street. That's all for IES standards, which is our calculation standards that we, we, we run our calculations through. Uh, this meets our calculation uh, per code uh, and energy code. So we're not talking major levels of brightness, just basically to illuminate the, the area for driving and walking purposes. And that's going to be, again, on the street side, the west street side. To move into the light package, uh, that Marshalltown, or for, for what you guys are going to get in Marshalltown, uh, must go. Uh, one thing I want to really point out is the way Musco does their lighting. Uh, with LED optics, we have the um, ability to direct light in a lot better way than what old incandescent HID lights used to be. Uh, we can put optical um, lenses on it, on LED lights that basically take the light and really point it in a certain direction and not where it's supposed to go, but only where it is supposed to go. So in these photos here, it's kind of probably hard to tell through the granular of zoom here, but you'll notice that up in the stands, it gets really, really dark. But on the field, it's super bright. That is what is so great and amazing about how we're sports lighting packaging this, is that we're taking all this light and punching it straight on the courts and then reducing the amount of spill light out onto the property. So just a few uh, things, uh, comments also that Dr. Shudi already kind of mentioned is that we are only doing sports lighting on the southern tier sets of courts and on the pickleball courts. So along the north side, the two, two uh, three courts, those are no, they are not getting lighting. So we will not have any lighting in that general direction whatsoever. Um, so in order to get enough power into the pickle, into the courts, we got a lot of uh, light going on there. So you can see those numbers are quite a bit higher than what we would see on the, on the street or on the parking lot. Completely different type of lighting that we're talking about. Just some more visualization, just kind of showing you that we ran the gambit of really trying to make sure where our light was. Um, this one's important because this is the closest one to the, the property line. And from our calculations, the closest pole is going to be about 22 feet away from that property line there on the north side. But all the lighting will be pointed this direction going to the south. And they have put visors and again, they've put op optics on their LEDs to push all the light in one certain direction, not to backlight. Um, so that is a very important concept to understand. So there's the overall layout. Again, the parking lot over here, we got the Southern tier of, uh, of courts and then the pickleball courts that are, are having lighting. Two poles for the pickleball courts. One thing I want to notice is that we did do luminance calcs at the property line and they're quite a bit less than what even our parking lot is. So when you're talking about spill light, uh, we're eliminating that spill light at the parking, uh, at your property, uh, property line. Um, you will get an ambiance glow, but that's, uh, that's, that's not a direct glare bomb coming from these lights. You will not see a direct source of light from these lights. It'll just be a glow from that general direction and it will not illuminate your backyard or be streaming in through your windows. Lucas, that's a very good point too with, uh, with LED being very directional. You will be able to see light on the tennis courts or the pickleball courts, but you will not be able to see the light source that's actually lighting those courts. So from the residents there on, on the north side, you will not, you'll be able to look out your back door and see that there's light on those courts. But between those courts and you will be dark because all light is directed at that and you'll never, you will not see the light source that is lighting those courts. And just to give you a few more visualizations here is we did more calculations, just again, double checking, making sure that we're not spilling light onto people's properties. Um, 
this is what you will see for a poll. Um, you'll see this is quite a large poll. I think we're going with 50 foot poles there at, this, uh, at these locations. Um, but as you see, they're very large uh, visors to help with that glare and cut off. Uh, one last thing is that I'm sure you guys all want to know is how late at night will these thing, will these lights be on? Um, we have complete control over these as far as giving it over, handing it over to this Marshalltown School District to control what time of night those are allowed to be on and then also um, putting controls in that has settings that people can't come up, push the button and they turn on. There's a curfew limit. Um, and that's all controlled by the school district themselves. So um, 10 o'clock at night, no one can come play and push this button to turn on the lights. The lights will not turn on after 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock or whatever the curfew is set. And that, is, that can be determined by the school district at any point in time. Um, at that point, uh, I'm pushed through my presentation. I will hand it over. The uh, city curfew. I think I got you cut for off there. 18 and the city curfew for 18 and under is 11 o'clock. So that'll be the the time for which uh, you will not allow the lights to be used after 11. And I would imagine that we can. Uh, set the controls in such a way that they shouldn't be able to be turned on before they're needed also. So I'll try to save energy that way as well. And that is correct. You'll be able to, uh, as far as the control side goes, you will be able to set the controls to the lights, the power to the push button. So you'll have a push button for each set of three quarts and for the pickleball. So you'll be able to set a time uh, so it, let's say 30 minutes prior to sunset, you can push the button for the pickleball and allow the lights come on at the pickleball courts for a set amount of time, let's say 30 minutes. And then that strobe light will flash to alert the players that, hey, if you don't go push that button again, the lights will go off. And so really what the school district is going to control is – what hours of operation to that push button are you going to allow? So typically that's 30 minutes prior to sunset till, for example, 11 p.m. So at 11 p.m. or 11.01, if somebody comes up and pushes the push button, those lights will not come on. The other value with that is that if it's raining out, the lights aren't on. Or if it's snowing, the lights aren't on. Somebody has to physically be at those courts in order to push the button to have those lights operational. Okay, so my name is Mindy Bringleson and I'm a CGA and I'm the civil engineer on the project. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. Uh, so Kevin had alluded to this uh, earlier, uh, or shown you this drawing and um, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, how the site drains, um, just so that you know what's gonna happen because we are uh, placing in a little bit more pavement than what was there uh, previously. So uh, north is up and here are the properties that are along Ingledew, as was mentioned. Um, and here's the new parking lot. And pickleball, the stairs up from the existing school uh, east parking lot. Uh, and the court layout. So the current courts and the new proposed courts are have about the same uh, uh, north line. This remains the same. And the slope on the existing eight courts, um, all of that when when it rains, that water runs through across those courts uh, this way to uh, South Second Avenue. Um, so our design here, if you see these solid lines, each one of those represents a foot. And these dashed lines are what's uh, existing out there. So we're making a few modifications to the grades, but primarily these courts are going to um, drain the exact same way as the previous ones did. So when it rains, everything will run towards uh, in this direction. We do have a couple of interceptors here that will kind of pick some of most of that up. Uh, and take it to a piping system underground. 
um, which is shown a little better in this drawing. So that's what you see here. These lines are storm piping, and that will take them to this area. So this is, um, better seen here, is a dry detention area. So this is in place because this uh, city has a requirement that uh, we do not increase uh, stormwater runoff with uh, additional pavement. So that's what this uh, serves. And so in most, most of the time, uh, this will be dry. And as you can see, we're digging this down in this corner. Um, so this will be um, dry and maintained kind of as a lawn. And then when it rains, especially during heavy rains, this is going to fill up and if um, the, the primary outlet from that is a, a pipe that runs here along the side, so this is all underground, um, and then it will discharge and go back to the east where the school has uh, additional detention facilities. So there's nothing going to the north or back out to second, um, South Second Avenue. If by chance this has a uh, a storm that it can't handle, which would be something like over a 500 year storm, um, it then would overtap and go out into the street and pick up with the city storm sewer system, which uh, we don't anticipate that happening um, really ever. Uh, in addition, we have some drainage area over on this side that also allows for some storm water. So that's the, that's the primary thing that I was going to speak to and just let you know there's not going to be a lot of elevation change through this area um, and we will have just a small wall around the pickleball, pickleball courts as we kind of set them into this hillside. So if uh, Dale, if you are on still, uh, we wanted to talk about the construction a little bit, if you could explain the timeline for work in the buildings and your hours of operation and, and completion and contractor parking. Yeah, so uh, site work timeline, we're still looking, um, I'm looking at the schedule here because I don't have all this memorized, so excuse me if I take a minute to find this, but um, site work, some of the biggest uh, items that are going to be going on would be the storm to the north, um, as Mindy mentioned, that, that drains the retention pond that runs to the east. Um, that is going to be taking place more than likely the end of next week, if not be the following week. That's going to be kind of a big deal because it's a pretty deep um, drainage system, which will be uh, kind of a big task to get finished up. Uh, once that's done, we got chemically grade, uh, chemically treating the subgrade to um, get a good base for the new tennis courts. All in all, the storm system and the grading and all that stuff, I believe we have finishing up around the 1st of July. So there'll be a lot going on, a lot of equipment moving on around there um, until the 1st of July, moving dirt, uh, placing dirt, grading it, uh, underground rough-ins for electrical, underground rough-ins for the storm water, which there's a lot of uh, underground storm system underneath of these tennis courts that drains the water out from underneath the tennis courts. Uh, so bigger items that'll be coming up would be like the foundations in the CMU for the new restrooms and the storage building. We are anticipating those to get started around mid to late July. You'll see the building start going up as well as uh, the, the asphalt paving will be going down. The asphalt paving has to be down for, I think it was 28 days before we can do anything else with the Ports as far as the uh, acrylic coatings and stuff like that. Uh, once the once the cure time's done, the acrylic coatings come in, and then of course finishes like your tennis 
netting, uh, your chain link fence stuff goes up, and really the job will really be coming together at that time when that when that happens. So um, really, some of the some of the bigger factors that are key dates that we're going to be starting on. We are looking at uh, a completion date right now of October 7th. And I believe the first schedule uh, on this project was a two phase schedule lasting into, uh, is that November, I believe? So they can correct me if I'm wrong. But the school has allowed us to do this project as a one phase due to uh, basically the COVID 19 situation we're in with sports being shut down there, you know, allowed us to go ahead and do this project in one timeline instead of two, which we were able to cut about a month off of the schedule. Uh, contractor parking, right now we are basically pulling into the site to park anybody that's there. If we do overrun or where we cannot get into the site because it's too muddy or something like that, on the southwest corner of our project, there is some parking right along the side of the road. We will be using those for parking. I don't anticipate too much parking over there. Normally everybody pulls into the job site. Working hours, we have been normally around 8 to 4, 4.30. Um, I mean, the earliest we would be there ever would be 7 o'clock and you know possibly work until five i would say would be the latest and i don't know if anybody's got any issues with that but they can bring it up in questions if they do we'd be more than happy to work around that uh completion schedule i guess i already kind of went over that that is uh october 7th and that's you know roughly a month prior to what the original timeline was that's about all i have Thank you, Dale. You're welcome. If that we, we would like to open it up to any questions that anybody has. Yeah, I think we have two residents that um, are on the call and we'd be more than happy to field any questions, whether you wanted to speak verbally or throw something in the question and answer or the chat. Um, I think I will just add that um, Kevin, who's the lead architect from FEH, as well as myself, um, are Marshalltown graduates, and I'm a resident, and we absolutely uh, want a project to be done right, uh, both for the school district community and uh, to be aesthetically pleasing for the residents. And so <clears throat> part, you know, I was very, it was very disappointing, obviously, that for this project, we had to pull out all of those mature arbovitas. Um, interestingly enough, and I wasn't, I don't remember when they were planted, but they were, they were planted in a way that didn't really provide wind protection, which is usually what you, you plant them for. Um, wind screen, to be a natural windscreen, they really need to be on the north side of the courts and the west side of the courts. And so that's where we intend to do the planting. So obviously it'll take, you know, some time for them to grow to maturity, but um, they will eventually provide not only a windbreak, but also a little bit more aesthetically pleasing view for the residents along Ingledew and, and 2nd Avenue South. Uh, we will have some uh, man-made windscreens that are on the fences as well as our tennis coaches would tell you that's a bit of a wind tunnel out there on certain days but um, we're working with the uh, graduating class of 1969 that did the fundraising effort for the whole town regarding tornado recovery and they've agreed to uh, donate the arbovitas and then We'll be working with Park and Rec in the city and just uh, volunteers. Hopefully we can get our student athletes, both from the boys and girls program. And we usually have somewhere between 80 and 100 kids between those two programs to be involved, you know, in a community service project, uh, probably in the fall, which is the best time to do the planning uh, of those arbovitas. 
but we'd love to take any questions that anyone would have. It looked like we had two uh, residents uh, that were on the call. Yeah, well, hi, I'm Don Dizer, and we are one of the Ingle Do. My husband is I are here. First of all, thank you. We're very excited to see this project going on. Um, I think it's going to be a great addition. We're really looking forward to having the pickleball courts added. Um, one of the questions we had is, are there going to be entrances to the courts on the north side, or is everything going to be from that main entrance? I'll throw that to you, Kevin. <laughs> I couldn't Gary. tell from the drawing. Sure. The, the main entrance is located, obviously, on the west side, but there is also right. an entrance on the east side, and we've got a couple access gates on the north and the south, okay. obviously, for chasing a ball or whatever it may be. Yeah, because they don't do good things to the lawnmower, let me tell you. That's a bad thing. <laughs> and I've sent a few of them to the lawnmower. Um, one of the other questions was the restrooms. Are those only going to be open and available when you have meets and things going on? Or are those going to be open at all times? Though we plan for those to be open, you know, at all times other than in the winter, obviously, when we'll have it, it shut down. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a community use facility, so we want it used as much <laughs> as possible. So our intention will be to to have those restrooms open more times than not. Okay. That's as well as the facility and able to be accessed. I think the only time will be, you know, locking gates or doors and that sort of thing will be to shut it down for the winter time. Okay. Yeah, okay, so that was one of the questions. So where do the pickleballs fall into the footprint of what's already there? Are they, are you building, is there going to be dirt work to build those up from the drawings? I can't really tell. Yeah, they're actually on the far east side, uh, just off of the sidewalk that takes you to the Performing Arts Center there. Okay. So they're going to be kind of tucked in that corner close to, um, you know, not on the boundary line, obviously, but just off the boundary line of the residence that would be um, off of Third Avenue so, South and then would. Okay. So are they going to be set down lower then? Are they going to be left yeah, down lower? Because that's they way. Will be, they will be lower than the tennis courts. Okay. You look at the image that I've got up, they're about halfway between the sidewalk that's there and the tennis court elevation. Okay. And then the retaining wall on the lower side. That's what the darker line represents. Okay. All right. Yeah, because there's that's quite a slope because that's where when our kids were little, that's where they always sledded. So that's a pretty good size hill to have to drop down there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And actually, the layout's a little bit different than what you see. Two of the courts will be running north and south, similar to um, the tennis courts, and then one of them will be running east to west. And, and a lot of that just has to do with the footprint that we had to work with and uh, okay. trying to keep the expense uh, within our budget. Oh, yeah. Any other okay. questions? That'll be a huge asset, as, as I said earlier, and I'm glad to hear that you're excited about that. Oh, we are. We are. We are definitely yeah. excited uh, to have that as part of this because we, we go and well, now this summer we won't be able to, but we, uh, we draw our lines and we just play pickleball on the t regular tennis courts is what we've been doing. So this will be nice for us. Well, and one of the things that I didn't mention was, um, you know, we're working very closely with uh, James Christensen, our head boys tennis coach, is also has a, a tennis summer academy for kids. And then we're working with Jeff Hubbard from Park and Rec. We really want to um, get full exposure to tennis, particularly to all our youth trying to grow the program. And so we're going to be incorporated uh, tennis fundamental instruction through our elementary schools, through the net generation program that 
USDA has, and then working with Jeff at Park and Rec to try to accommodate both recreational and, and initial instructional play, as well as competitive play to the kind of kids that decide that they um, are interested in that. And so we're going to be putting blended lines on blended lines or junior lines for tennis for like eight and under and 10 and under before they're ready for, you know, the full court experience and they use a different size ball. So the six tennis courts that are furthest to the west, closest to the restrooms, will have blended lines for youth tennis play. Okay. The courts that are furthest east will stay pure tennis, but our intention will be down the road to likely put blended lines on those that will accommodate additional pickleball play. So with temporary pickleball nets being able to be used off of the tennis nets and putting some blended lines on um, in the future, we can hopefully accommodate even more pickleball play down the road. Hey, Taryn, this is Gary Schulte. I yeah. just wanted to mention on those pickleball courts, that layout is actually going to stay the way it is because uh, when we tried to rotate the courts, we got into too many problems with the lighting. Okay, I thought that okay. So we're going to keep them all facing that way. All right. Yes, correct. Any other questions from either of the neighbors that are on? We had a couple school board members that were also on here as well that are part of our board subcommittee on facilities. So thank you, Sean and Sarah, for attending the meeting. And we did record this, so if any of your neighbors uh, indicate that they wish to have been able to participate or watch, uh, just have them send me an email and I'll be more than happy to send them uh, the recording. Sounds good. Yeah, I wanted to thank everybody too. Um, as Theron was saying, I know you, everybody there in the community Plus, the, you know, the school and everything, um, talking about quality of work, uh, Garland Construction is very dedicated to this project. Um, I feel we have a very good team as far as uh, architectural-wise with FEH and with every uh, engineering team that's involved with electrical, you know, civil and plumbing and everything. Uh, the, the contractors that we're working with on this project Several of them we've done business with for a long time. And believe me when I say, they are some of the best contractors that we, that we usually hire. So um, if any point, uh, anybody around there, the neighbors has any issues at all, don't be afraid to contact Theron and he can tell me or anybody, but uh, the job will be kept clean and very respectable around there for everybody. So thank you. All right, well, thanks everyone. Good evening.